just a great privilege to have Rich Martini, the real Rich Martini, in our midst. <laughs> Not only uh, snippets, perhaps, from his movie, but uh, uh, he'll uh, interact and uh, bring to you some really mind-stretching uh, kinds of uh, researches that he's engaged in. And uh, I've read every word of his book, and it's fascinating stuff. And without further ado, please welcome Rich Martini. All right, without further ado, actually with a lot of ado, I'm going to give you lots of ado. My middle name should be ado. But a little bit about myself. I'm a writer, director. I've written and directed about eight feature films. That's been my path. And it somehow, I, you know, it led me to this moment here in time. Um, and somewhere along the line, I started making documentary films, which are, are films that I thought were interesting. I've been working on one about Amelia Earhart for a number of years. And uh, this topic came up. I'll tell you about it in a second. Um, but uh, maybe I should tell you about it now. I don't think that's probably the good idea, because the preamble to this is the following. I was here in, and by the way, the, the, the topic for tonight is love is God, okay? As opposed to the other way around, we've heard it our entire lives. So about 1996, I was here in Santa Monica and my close friend, closest friend of the planet, uh, was passing away. Um, she had breast cancer, her name was Luana Andrews, she's an actress, been in 30 uh, feature films, Easy Rider, and over 300 uh, TV movies, and so she, she'd been around quite a bit, and we would met while I was at USC Film School. And I would go by her house on Sunday afternoons and read her the paper, paralyzed at that point. And um, so one day we were sitting around chatting, and she said, I think I'm going to another galaxy. And I said, what, what makes you think that? She said, well, I have this recurring dream that I'm um, in a classroom in another part of the universe and everyone in the classroom is dressed in white and they're speaking a language I've never heard before, but somehow I completely understand the language. And I thought, okay, that's the morphine talking. You know, that's, I mean, people hallucinate and you know, maybe that's what that is. But then the day she passed away, um, her close friend called me from Hawaii to sort of talk about our journey together. And uh, she said, oh, I had a wonder, most wonderful dream last night. She, I saw Luana in what she said, the fourth dimension. And she was in the classroom. And everyone was dressed in white. And she seemed really happy. And I said, well, did she tell you about this? Was that, oh, that's Luana calling. Excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I said, did she, did she mention that to you? You know, and no, she'd never heard, never said that. And then I mentioned it to the nurse who was taking care of her, and she nearly fainted and said, that was her recurring dream. Okay, classrooms in the afterlife. Hmm, what's that about? I, I just filed it away, like, oh, that's something to really examine at some future point in my life. And then I was in New York City uh, working for our mutual friend Charles Grodin, um, the actor at a talk show. And so while I was there in New York, he had me producing sort of men in the street comic bits. And one day, um, and let me pause here for a second, the day she passed away, I had this kind of profound vision where as I was, it was the middle of the night, and the, uh, the phone rang, and the voice on the phone said, uh, you paged me. <laughs> you know, people, how they're so, with an attitude, you paged me. I said, no, I didn't, I think you got the wrong number. So I hung up the phone, so I was awake. And then as I closed my eyes, I suddenly felt this intense light come down from the sky, and just envelop me completely. Now my eyes were closed, but you know how you can feel it, like, oh my gosh, like what happened? Did the roof come off? And then the sound of like a earthquake, like an earthquake, where like a train coming through, like just roaring, train moving, like the bed was shaking, and I thought, you know, oh my gosh, it's an earthquake. We're in the middle of it, as we know. And, but it wasn't that. And I became aware that I was in some kind of a, a tunnel, but not going that way, like that way, almost like a volcano. And I, could, I was aware of the fact that the walls around me were bright orange colored. Um, 
like heat, but I didn't feel any heat. And then I was aware that I was moving up this volcano. And I was like in, on the platform going up. Anyway, and it's, it was so intense that I passed out. I fainted. And when I came to, you would think I would, you know, well, what was that about? But no, I was still in this intense dream, but I had gone further up and I was at the top of the volcano. And I heard Luana's voice in my ear say, isn't this unbelievable? <laughs> and it was her voice as she was at 21. I met her when she was 30. So I was aware that that was the younger version of her voice. That's weird. How could it, why would she be younger? Anyway, and I was so freaked out, like, what is going on? And I said, I don't think I'm supposed to go here with you. And in that moment, I passed out. Now, years later, and I'll get to this, I was in Tibet with Robert Thurman, Uma Thurman's father. And he described something called a, a creation dream that's common in Tibetan mythology. And it's identical to what I just described, the volcano and earth being, you know, and he had the same vision in his life. So I thought, well, that's so unusual that we would have that same vision at the same time in some different parts of the planet. So that was that, was that, that experience. And the next morning, Luana passed away. So, so now I'm in New York working on the Charles Grodin show, and I um, started wondering, you know, if she came to me and spoke to me at 21, then that means, therefore, she must exist outside of herself somewhere. Where is it? And I had an out-of-body experience. Has anyone had an out-of-body experience or know what that is? <coughs> You know what that is? Robert Monroe wrote a number of books called Journeys Out of My Body back in the 1980s. He was an astrophysicist, actually, who started having these experiences where he would float around the room in the midst of a dream, and then he started testing it out. Like, while I'm floating around the room, could I tap someone on the shoulder and then call them the next day? And, and he did that as a scientist and found out that he could go places somehow. No, he didn't know how. But he sort of perfected the technique of out-of-body travel in a sense of like planning it yourself. So I'm aware of it because when I was in my 20s, I started having those experiences. And I never, I, I put them aside. It wasn't that important to me. <laughs> you know, I'd float around the room, I'd be like, oh, okay, well, that was weird. <laughs> or um, I'd be staying in an old hotel somewhere, and I'd have the experience of someone sitting on the bed next to me. And you know, wake up like, what the, who's that? And, and then realize there's no one there. And then eventually that progressed into other events. So has anybody here ever had a, you know, a relative or a ghost story or somebody come and visit them? So, you know, and you either focus on it like, oh, that's scary, or you go, well, whatever. You know, that's not that meaningful in your life. I mean, I'll give you two uh, events that happened to me. One was I was teaching in Maine and there was a, um, I was at this, this workshop in Maine, in Camden, Maine, and I woke up and standing in front of me, as clear as a bell, was a Mohawk Indian carrying a, a, an axe and a, um, what are the other thing they used to carry? They, they always carried these two weapons. A tomahawk, yeah, tomahawk and an axe. And it was like he was covered in blood or paint. I didn't, you know, it was red. And he was screaming at me to wake me up. As if to say, get out. <laughs> and then, you know, my reaction was like, wow, what's that? And I thought, okay, okay. And then, you know, and then he disappeared. And I thought, well, dude, you know, I'm the only teaching here, okay? So, you know, please just don't wake me up. And, you know, I would sleep with the TV on and all the lights on, okay? Because, like I say, I just, I wasn't that focused on what is it. But now here's my friend who's passed away, okay? So the question I had was, where is she? If it's possible, but where the heck did she go? So, one afternoon, I'm in the Upper West Side in my apartment, and I go to take a nap, and I have that weird feeling that everything starts to buzz, and I thought, oh, I'm having one of those out-of-body experiences. But in this particular case, I shot out of my body like a lightning bolt, and it was like I could see New York below you know, like the powers of 10, like suddenly there goes the city, and now I'm traveling through outer space. 
and I can see stars going past me, but so fast that the light was like, you know, blending. And then I took a turn, and I can only describe it as, because I saw the movie Contact after this happened, like going through a black hole. So my body sort of, or my whatever it is that's traveling, your consciousness, is flying around this kind of weird thing, tumbling and turning, and then I came out of the other side, the another universe, I don't know, but now instead of going this direction, I was going that direction. I'm just describing it as I experienced it, okay? And the stars were now going this way. And then I stopped, and in front of me was Luana. Her eyes were closed, and she opened them. And I thought, well, here you are. It was as if she was saying, you wanted to know where I am. Here I am. And at that moment, some knucklehead outside the window blasted his truck horn. And before his hand came up, so imagine how short that amount of time is, I traveled back like a rubber band. Whoop! And then I saw New York coming up a million miles an hour, and then boom, I was away. So... I, that could have been a dream, it could have been a vision, it could have been a fantasy. It's possible. However, from the way I work as a person, I kind of go, well, what was that? And if that was something, what could it be? And if Luana exists out there in the realm, how do I go back and visit her without getting on a spacesuit? <laughs> so I started to study the afterlife just as a concept. And I was in New York, and I had read about Robert Thurman. I don't know if you're familiar with his work. He's a, a Buddhist, very famous Buddhist author. He wrote uh, a translation of the Tibetan Book of the Dead, many other things. He's famous for being Uma Thurman's dad. He was the first Westerner uh, named a Tibetan monk back in 1960. Um, and you know, he's a very unusual guy, very smart. Uh, he's the head of Columbia um, Tibetan Studies there. So. I started taking his class because I thought, well, they know the Tibetans, the Book of the Dead, <laughs> maybe they know. And uh, we became friends and I traveled with him to India and I traveled with him to Tibet and I shot a documentary in Tibet for Tibet House and that all became part of my journey of studying Tibetan philosophy. Is this the answer? <laughs> and at some point I realized in Tibetan philosophy, they kind of, their, their belief is that we exist after our lifetime as a wisp of smoke. That <clears throat> you may have heard the term the bardo. So the bardo is where once you die, your wisp of smoke goes out there. And depending on your karma, we've all heard that term, mm -hmm. on your karma, the acts that you did in your past life, then you that dictates who you're going to be. Okay? That's their philosophy that doesn't make sense to me, but I was, you know, I wanted to understand it, so I studied it, so I could understand what they were saying. But there was something that was missing, and it was this. One day here in Santa Monica, I had the experience of, I don't even know what you'd call it, but maybe it's dying, I had a bad cold, I was laying in bed, but I felt myself dissolve into a sea of atoms. And I was very blissful. It was really wonderful. And I felt like this intense feeling of bliss. But it was so intense, it was like I was trying to keep my consciousness focused on what is this? What is this feeling I'm having? And I suddenly, I felt like I, I was connected to everyone and everything. Okay? That we were all just atoms in a golden sea of water. And that what your feeling is towards me, I can feel it and I can send love back to you. And it was a really incredible experience. But I was also aware that I was conscious of, of this moment. So some consciousness must exist in my mind. I was also aware that wherever a photograph was of me, I could travel to it because the photograph had, I, had, I guess, had captured a magnetic moment in time, okay? Like a hologram. But somehow, because of wherever this energy field I was in, I could go there. So I suddenly was, you know, in somebody's pocket, you know, somebody in attic, you know, I saw these photographs of myself as a kid. I was just trying to hold on to the consciousness of what I was experiencing, and then I fell asleep. 
So, um, so that's why I say it just didn't ring <coughs> true to me that between lives we were a wisp of smoke. So, I got a call from a um, friend of mine in London who said he wanted to come. I'm just I'm telling you how I got to this research we're about to see. This friend of mine called me. He said, come to London. I've got this terrific show we're going to work on. I'm sending you a ticket. And so I got on a plane and I flew off to London. And there was no show. It was like a really wonderful, generous offer on his part, but it, it was, there was nothing there. He didn't have a show, he didn't have the money, he didn't. But he introduced me to a close friend of his, a guy named Robert Beer, who was an Oxford professor. Um, but when I shook his hand, and I don't know if anybody has had this experience, but when I shook his hand, I felt, oh, this is the guy. This is who you're supposed to meet. Have you ever had that experience? So you have. So, and you know, you file it away, like, oh, okay. And then I started, be I became friends with him. And, uh, you know, emails. And then he wrote me this note and said, my daughter died. She had a boating accident, and I'm beyond sadness. I don't really know how to move on. And I, at the time, had been reading a book by Carol Bowman, who studied with Ian Stevenson at the University of Virginia. Carol Bowman's book is called Children's Past Lives. And what she had done is she had cataloged numerous children in the U.S. who remembered past lives. Ian Stevenson's work at the University of Virginia, he'd been there for 40 years, going around the world in Asia where cultures believe in reincarnation, and cataloging that. Well, she was just working on American kids who remembered in the Civil War, and she was able to actually, you know, find out that that person actually, has anyone seen that ABC show that just recently was done on 2020 about a kid who remembered being a, war, a fighter pilot in World War II? His father has written a book. Um, it's quite amazing. They did a whole hour of it uh, on on whatever that show is, that you know, ABC 2020. And this kid remembered being a pilot and remembered details, and, and they tracked down his friends. And, and the friends, who were still alive, said, yeah, this kid knows everything about this pilot. And he'd had dreams and nightmares, and he, and he knew what plane he flew, et cetera, et cetera. And Carol Bowman was involved in helping this. <laughs> this kid, you know, go through these, these sessions. All right. So you're with me. I'm, I'm on the path. I haven't quite gotten anywhere, but I'm with Robert Beer in London. And I send, and I send, anyway, I'm back in the States, but I sent him this book. And he writes me back and says, check into the work of Michael Newton. So I hadn't heard of Michael Newton. Has anyone here in the room heard of Michael Newton? A couple. Okay. Oh, copy of Journey of Souls. So I, I picked up Journey of Souls. Uh, and then, now this is where we take a turn. Michael Newton was a psychologist here in Los Angeles in the 1950s. He didn't believe in past life regression. Um, you might have heard of Brian Weiss. He's the guy who wrote Many Lives, Many Masters. He was a Yale psychiatrist whose clients spontaneously remembered previous lifetimes and cured themselves of phobias. So Brian Weiss started examining that because, because, as his point was, if you're cured of something, then great. What does it matter? Who does it hurt, whether it's true or not? Michael Newton was a skeptic. So um, you might have heard of the Bridie Murphy case. Bridie Murphy, back in the 1950s, was a woman who claimed she grew up in Ireland and that she had, in Time magazine, everybody did a thing about it. Is past, and this is that's how the rage of past life regression started in the 50s. Okay, so people called up Michael Newton and said, Can you do a past life regression? And he said, I, I don't believe in it. I'm sorry, it's not my thing. And then one day, he had a, a client who came in, and his presenting problem was a sore shoulder that no doctor could tell him what the problem was. And so he went into his hypnosis, uh, you know, the couch session whatever that is, and said, take me to the source of your pain. And this guy said, oh, I'm a World War I British sergeant, and I've just been stabbed by a German soldier. And Newton, Michael Newton, because he didn't believe him, oh, really? What's your regiment? What's your mother's maiden name? What street did you grow up on? So he grilled him the way you would somebody you don't believe what they're saying. And he took notes, 
And then the guy called up the next day and said, oh, man, my shoulder's fine. My wife wanted to thank you. You know, my shoulder's okay now. And unbeknownst to the client, he sent a letter to the British War Office in London, and they confirmed that this guy did exist in the Fourth Corps, and his name was such and such, and he was born on such and such a day. So from that point forward, Michael Newton started seeing past life regressions, okay? Now, in the 1960s, a woman came in, and that was Michael Newton flashing us. A woman came in in the 1960s. We're getting to Michael. Michael, we're getting to you, okay? I'm getting... Woman came in and said, uh, No signal. No signal. No signal. All right. The exterior input. <laughs> That's me. I'm the exterior input. So, so this woman came into Michael's office, and her presenting problem was that she was extremely lonely and depressed. Felt no reason to be on the planet. And so he thought he was treating depression, and he said, Take me to the source of your pain, especially if a group is involved. And what she said, then said is, oh, I see. I'm with my soul group where we are between lives. And I see that we have agreed not to be together in this lifetime. And Newton said, where are we? Is this in the past? Is this in the future? And she said, no, it's now. It's, it's now. I'm with them now in the between lives area. <laughs> so Newton, when she left, said, you know, I didn't, first I didn't believe in past life regressions, and now this, there's some kind of a realm that we go to. So he closed his public practice, and for the next 30 years, only interviewed people who could take him to that realm. None of them knew each other. 7,000 people over 30 years. And he published his first book in 1994, Journey of Souls. The next one was published about four years later, Destiny of Souls. Um, and then he published The Life Between Lives, and then most recently, uh, Memories of the Afterlife, which is just accounts told by therapists that he's trained in his method. Okay? Bless you. And his method is, is pretty unusual, but this is what makes it worthy of our review and our discussion today, which is... He does six-hour sessions with people, deep hypnosis. So they come into his office. He then, the process is pretty simple. You, you have a, you go through your life, a relaxation and a deepening, and then you go through your life, you talk about your life, and then they'll ask you, very simply, take us to a previous existence that has some significance on this lifetime. People are free to say, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> There's no such thing. I don't. I, it's up to you. And what happens is, and this is uniform, and the seven thousand people have said the same thing. They not only remember a previous lifetime that has some significance in this life, but then it, they went, and then the process is you go to the end of that lifetime. You go. Let's go to the last day of that lifetime. And now I'd like you to tell me where you want to go. That's the question. And they all say the same thing. I want to go home. Now, when I read this, I thought, okay, this is either like a really profound ruse that this guy has come up with, or he's leading people. It just doesn't fit with anything that I'm aware of. So I took it upon myself to go and start a documentary about Michael Newton. I was going to do it about the afterlife, but I thought, if this guy's, what he's saying is true, this is the real deal. This is something we have to examine, okay? So that's where I'm going to take a pause and play this 10-minute clip where Michael Newton and other hypnotherapists, and I'll just tell you, I went to Chicago where they were having a conference. I wrote to them and said, I'd love to come and, and do this interview with Michael, and they said, he's retired, he doesn't do any more interviews. He's done with interviews. Really? Okay. Well, what about your conference? You're welcome. Come and film the conference. So when I got to Chicago, now, I'm as skeptical as anyone. I'm here as a skeptic. I'm here to say, and the word skeptic, uh, you know, if you, if you look it up, it really means you don't believe in the prevailing school of thought. So the prevailing school of thought is that this is all nonsense. It's not science-based. Okay? So I start there. What is it? 
And in, in, the, in this case, I decided I would f interview Michael Newton, and I met him, and 10 minutes later he said, all right, I'll give you an interview. So this is the last interview he'll ever give in his lifetime. And then I interviewed people that, that have been trained with him, and then I started filming people under deep hypnosis, okay? Spent a week filming people over and over again. You'll see some of that. And then I filmed myself because I wanted to see how real or false is this. And then I did it as a person like, they're not going to lead me anywhere because I won't let them. So when I, we come back from that, we'll, we'll see. All right? <laughs> how are we doing so far? You guys with me? <laughs> All right. Not too bad? You can go. You don't have to stay here. I feel bad for you. All right, so let's see what I've done that's goofed us up. Play is not the right button, but let's do this again. Everything goes on, on. Let's just try that. <coughs> Remote control. Invented by Nikola Tesla, you know. Uh, <laughs> all right, are we on? Oh, boy, I have to, I have to really do the whole thing. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, that's this should do it. And this did it go off? Yeah, I think this is what went off. Oh, this is <coughs> All right, there we go. It's on. And switching to a turnstile. There we go. I I did the music by the way. <laughs> Typical life between life regression is at least four and a half hours long. And the reason it has to be so long is because one needs to achieve a certain level of trance depth in order to access the superconscious mind. Now the superconscious mind is the mind that has the soul memories. Uh, I gave him the command, I want you to go to the origin of this pain. And he was getting in a little ahead of me. He was actually a little deeper than I thought. And he jumped into the past life as a soldier in World War I. And he was being bay bayoneted. He was a British sergeant. And it was the first battle of the Somme. I think it was 1916. I couldn't believe what was happening to me. And this fellow was lying in the mud and, and groaning. And I was trying to get his uh, arm patch and infant, because I am a historian. I was more interested in, in trying to verify the British unit that he claimed to be with and a number of other facts and instead of uh, gently desensitizing this horrible trauma he was going to do, and eventually I did do that. Well, help me understand this, that all of you could collectively show this. All, all participants collectively showed others about love, greed, hate, love, strength, endure, enduring, enduring no matter what, surviving the worst, on a deeper level. You mean those in the camps? Um, those in the camps, but also those that participated. Those that participated as well. Those that participated also were, it was like two, there were many polarities being played out and all participants were a part of that demonstration. It seems to be a common theme. I mean, what we experienced yesterday in, in, in the regression. Here's someone who uh, is in the Holocaust and is a victim. And as tragic and horrible as that is, from that perspective, in spirit, from that expanded state of consciousness, felt compassion for the perpetrators, for the pain that their souls experienced in playing that role. Not, not to make it right, it is a terrible tragedy, it's horrible. And at the same time, sometimes things that we judge from our human perspective as being right or wrong or, or bad has a very essential role. Uh, do this for me now, Alfred. I want to move forward to the very last day of your life, this Alfred. The very last day. Mm -hmm. well, not yet have crossed over, but it won't be the last day. Last day. Yes, so. I've been shot from just. I mean, two people behind me trying to revive me. Where are you hit exactly? Do you know? Right in the heart. Is this. Do you know. Did you see who shot you? 
when it was just a shot that came out of nowhere. Yeah, no, we did. But they were looking for me. of this particular universe. Why would you need to do this? The people just want to explore. They just, they are, they want to know who they are, really who they are, and why they're in this world. And, you know, everybody in the world wants. There's nobody, I think, on this planet that doesn't want to know that. There you go. Just the trail. So, you get a sense of the world thing. And you know, as I sit here in this wonderful hallowed hall, and I think about you know my journey to come here and, and to get to know Reverend Wood and his flock, and you know the wonderful people here, you know, and so I went, and now I'll get into it a little bit, so you but you understand that the the you know physical what goes on, like what is this about? But I want you to think about it in this other term for a second, which is the, the theme of this, which is that love is God. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so as I started hearing this and started exploring and started examining it, I started to see everything from this different perspective. I felt like I had taken the red pill, as they say in the movie The Matrix. I did my own past life regression and life between life session, I'll tell you about that in a second. And when I came away from it, because I went in as a skeptic, I came out of it going, oh my gosh, I feel like the planet has shifted a few degrees. And then as I examined it, I realized that everything that Jesus says, as well as other great religious leaders, but when you start to reread what he's saying about I am the light, I am the way, and through me, you can find this eternal truth. Um, just as an example, and I've got this from the Reverend, which is, you know, you examine the text. What does the text mean? So when you examine the text of, for example, the Holy Trinity, we all know it as the Father, Son. The Catholics always said, and the Holy Ghost. And so your concept was, well, there's God up there, and then there's Jesus, and then there's this, Dove. Always a symbol, the dove of light going back and forth between. But as I now see it and then understand the Aramaic, the original Aramaic is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Breath, Spiros, which was originally to breathe, breathing. So the word doesn't mean ghost, but that was the translation, you know, or the mistranslation, or spirit, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. But breath, breathing, what is the universe? What are we but this breathing mechanism of energy? So when you see it from the source or God, God the source, and we're going to talk about what, what the spirit world tells us what God is, pretty unusual. We'll get to that at the end if you're still here. <laughs> and then you've got the sun, which is who we are, and then you've got this thing that connects all of us. All right. So I'm just, I'm laying that in there because we're going to get to it at the end. So here's your buddy, Rich. I'm in Chicago. I've interviewed Michael Newton. I start filming these people and are 
I film a woman who's got agoraphobia and, uh, no, aquaphobia, sorry, and, uh, and during the course of her session remembers her previous life where she was drowned. And then in the session, because then they allow you to go up and look at it from above, from this home place, and she says, oh, the man who drowned me, the captain, he's come to me and he's saying to me, you have no idea how hard it was to do that to you in that lifetime. He's apologizing to her when she was an Irish sailor that he pushed overboard and drowned. And then she realizes, oh, I was a... I was a bad guy. I was a, a bad sailor. I mean, they, they would ship and run aground, and I was stealing food from everyone, and that's why they voted me off. And then she realized that this fellow who was there holding her hand and apologizing is her father in this life, and that he saved her from drowning as a little girl, something she had never known until that moment. So in that, and whether it's true or not, Let's just start there. Whether it's true or not, she was cured her of her aquaphobia in that moment, and I filmed her swimming the next day, well, a few weeks later. So that's a value to people who have a problem, an issue that they can't come to terms with medically or whatever. I mean, and if it's your subconscious helping you, then oh, fantastic. So in my case, um, the last day of the conference, they said, so Rich, do you want to do one? one of these Life Between Life sessions. And I thought, well, that takes me right out of the journalism category because, you know, unless you're um, Plimpton, George Plimpton, you know, Paper Tiger, okay, I'll be happy to. And I, I sat down and they said, ask you to write out a list of questions you might, you might ask. And I thought, I am not gonna let them guide me somewhere that doesn't exist. Because this might all be a ruse on my behalf. It might be fake. So I, I had a trick question in there, and I knew that only I knew the answer to that. And the other reason this was so dramatically confusing to me, and at the same time mind-blowing, you saw that little clip of that woman remembering a life in the Holocaust. This was the first person that I filmed. So they invited me into a room, not much, about the same size, and there were about 100 people sitting around. She's a hypnotherapist who works in, San, in um, Santa Fe. She, had never, she told me later on she had never had this past life memory before, but it came up this day. Turn my camera on, they introduce me, and they start doing as a sample session for all the students, because this is a conference. And she goes through her normal life. She grew up in Syracuse, you know, her sister hit her with a brick, you know, not too much of great interest. And then he, he says, now let's go to a previous life that has some significance to this lifetime. And she says, I'm naked, my head is shaved, I'm in a shower, and I'm waiting for them to turn it on. And because the way these hypnotherapists are trained, he doesn't ask her leading questions. He asks her questions, where are we? What year is this? What time is this? And she proceeds to describe Auschwitz. And then he says, well, let's, let's go back to a happier time of this life, because then you can see why you chose that lifetime, okay? So now she goes back to a happier memory and her family. And then eventually, everybody gets caught up in the Holocaust and her family. And there she is. And then she describes in graphic detail, and I'm a student of history, you know, when she says that the smell of the gas was a sweet smell, that wasn't a detail that I was aware of, but I was able to look that up. The Zyklon had a sweet smell to it. Um, and then she describes coming out of her body and going back to this home place and, and being meet greeted, as everyone says, by her spirit guide. And the spirit guide is someone you recognize instantly as somebody who's been with you for all your lifetimes. So now, your spirit guide, and this is what everyone says, I'm just gonna describe it to you. Um, they, they say you go back to your soul group and there's anywhere from three to 25 people in your soul group. Average is 15. If you want to figure out who those people are, they're generally people that you've met in this lifetime and you went, ah, I feel like I've always known you. There is some connection we've always had. That's generally who they are. Sometimes they're the pill. They're sometimes they're the, the person in your path, the stone in your path, who according to these people, you've made the agreement to be the stone in the path. Like this, a story conference before we choose to come here. 
okay, who's going to play? Reverend, you, you, could you play the Reverend this lifetime? I mean, I think you'll be great. At, you're hilarious. You're great. You're going you're gonna to help people. And you say, oh, come on. You know, I did that. Like, don't you remember the Crusades? I'm just like enough of that. And then I, I'm there arguing, no, 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 no. Cheryl's going to meet you. You guys, when you first connect, it's going to be like kismet, and you're going to create so much loving energy with so many people. Okay. This is what people report. Um, so, and it, and it goes on and on. So in this case, this particular woman, though, and then there's a, there, what some people call a council of elders, which if you've ever heard of a near-death experience, a lot of people say, I had this feeling I was in front of a council and I was being judged, or I had a past life review. Well, in this case, you get this full past life review, but they're not judging you. They're helping you examine who you are, what you've done, all your <clears throat> actions, good and bad. And you're harder on yourself than anybody else is. Oh, I really, you know, I didn't mean to do that. I really wanted to help that person, and I ended up hurting them. And they say, oh, you know, you have more lifetimes to work this out. So in her case, she's brought before her council of elders, and they say to her, you know, you did, you, you had a really tough life, but you really did, you helped people, you were sweet, and, and you were loving. And, and she says to them, why? Why did I choose such a difficult lifetime? I don't understand it. Everyone died in my, everyone I love died. And then she's saying that. Right there, she says, oh, they're showing me images. She says, I know this is going to be hard to understand, but they're showing me that it was harder to play the role of a perpetrator in that lifetime than a victim. Easily the most politically incorrect sentence I've ever heard in my life. It made me stop, full stop. My head shot up from the camera. I looked around the room like, did anybody just hear? That? Should she just say the Nazis had a harder time of it? What? I was offended, but at the same time I was flabbergasted. And then I heard it over and over and over again. With every lifetime, people have, every day there are things to go through. There's courage, there's loyalty, there's compassion. No matter where you are on the scale, you know, in the camp, Outside the camp, I got an email yesterday from an elderly gentleman who had watched one of my talks and said, I have felt guilty my whole life. I was in a concentration camp and a German soldier befriended me and saved my life. And I've always felt guilty that I survived when no one else did. And you've given me insight into how that might have happened insight into how that might have happened. So now it's, well, <laughs> once that comes off, you start to examine your life through that lens for a second. The stones in my path I agreed to so I could learn from them? What? <laughs> the people who are the pill in my life, I asked them to play that role? So a friend of mine called me up and said, like Vanessa here is going to go see Scott to Tamble tomorrow. She called me up and said, I read your book. I want to go do this. And I said, sure, that's great. She's a big executive in New York City. She flew in on the drive. I've known her since grade school. On the drive out to uh, Claremont, where Michael Newton has trained hundreds of therapists. Newtoninstitute.org um, has a list of them. You can find one near you. Scott happens to be in Claremont. It's a virtuoso. Highly recommended. And um, Scott DeTamble. And by the way, if you look me up on YouTube, Martini Flipside, you'll see Scott doing a live session we did over in Venice. I, I was doing a session there, and I was talking about my own past life review, which I'll get to. And in the midst of it, a woman burst into tears while she was listening to what I was saying. And then afterwards, Scott went up to her and said, are you okay? And she said, not really. <laughs> Something Richard said really went through me. And he said, would you like to try to examine it? And so right there live, he did. And it, it's fascinating. What's the last name again? My last name? last name? Oh, Scott, D-D-E, -D -E, and then Tamble. Like Russ Tamblin, but T-A-M-B-L-E. So where was I? Scott, where was I? Claremont. 
Claremont. <laughs> Reel me back in. Um, oh, your friend wanted to do a session. Oh, thank you. So we're driving out to Claremont, and she says, now, Richard, I know, you know, I'm a skeptic. I don't think I can be hypnotized because my brain doesn't stop. However, my father molested me as a kid, and my brother committed suicide, and these have been huge issues in my life. I never told you these things, but I've, I've never, a day hasn't gone by where I haven't thought about it, and it's disturbed me. I didn't know that. I'm, I'm sorry to hear that, but, you know, well, maybe we can find something out. So we went out to this session, and in the session, she, as much as a skeptic as she is, she had a really amazing past life memory of somebody I could look up, a, a, a captain of a ship in 1610 who was raided by pirates. I was able to find his address and the house he lived in, in London, because in, in London they keep the records of everyone who's been in front of the Old Bailey. And this guy's name was there from 1610. I was as startled as anybody. But that, the important was, thing was at some point she went into this between life realm and, and the question she had was why did my father or not, did this happen? And what she said was, oh, I see. I, out of compassion for him, I agreed to experience this so that he could learn from the negative implications of it. And in that moment was able not only to forgive him, but to see it from another perspective. And then about her brother, she said, oh, I see, my brother signed up to examine the energy of excess. And Scott said, oh, I'm sorry he wasn't able to fulfill it because he committed suicide or he did an overdose. And he, she said, no, no, <laughs> that's what he signed up for. He signed up for the energy of excess, to examine the energy of excess. And if you consider for a moment you're going to have a thousand lifetimes, let's just say, and I plead with you to play the role of the bad guy in this particular lifetime because you're going to help all these other people. I had this discussion with a Tibetan monk who said to me, because they believe karma dictates who you're born as, and he said, are you telling me that I would choose to be born in Africa, an HIV positive baby, an abject poverty? And I said, which one of those concepts is negative? Because when you take them apart, each one is a different form of compassion. The doctors have to learn how to help. The people around have to give of themselves to help. The life might even be only six weeks, six months. But the compassion of saying, I'll sacrifice all that work it takes so that others can learn from my loss, to me that sounds a lot like what Jesus did. And if you're, and you're familiar with the Gospel of Judas, if you've ever looked at that or seen that, you know, National Geographic did that thing, there's this wonderful conversation that Judas, of course, he's telling the story. So, you know, consider the source. But Judas says that Jesus comes to him and says, I need you to do me this favor. I need you to turn me into the Romans. Judas says, according to him, I could never do that. I love you. I could, don't ask me to do that. And Jesus says, and according to him, I need you to help me fulfill my destiny. That's what I'm here for. If you don't do that, I can't fulfill my, I can't help people if I don't get turned over by you. That's a profound meditation on forgiveness and compassion, whether it's true or not. It's still, it's, it's something to examine. Okay, so what about Rich? What was Rich in a past life? And again, I'm there, you know, I'm, I'm not going to be led. <laughs> They're not going to lead me. So the hypnotherapist, who, um, very politely is, you know, walking me through my, my life, which I thought was interesting because they take you to an incident that happened when you're like 11, I cut my finger badly. And I had the emotion of a kid when I cut my finger, I could feel it. Oh my gosh, I, you know, what am I going to do? And then I saw my dad, who had recently passed, come out of the garage to help me. This was like 66. And everything in my visual was, um, you know, the cars. I could see the cars in the driveway and the, the year that they were there. So. But of course, it's in my memory. It's not like I'm getting it from somewhere, right? Anyway, so the, the emotion of seeing my father was overwhelming and that he was going to help me. So I noted that. So now we go back. He says, let's go to your first memory. 
And my first memory was being born. I had never had it before, but I was suddenly in a cold room and bright lights, and I could see this guy's face, this doctor's face, with his mask, with you know the hat, and back in the 50s, they used to have this little metal thing, you know, and I could see his hazel eyes, as clear as a bell. The only thing that was weird was he was doing this. So he was obviously holding me up like that, but I was looking at him right side up. So, but I was, and I said, my dad's not here because he's on his way here. Now, I didn't know that, but when I called my mom afterwards, she told me that dad was on his way there. So, okay, we're not there yet. So now he says, now let's go to a previous life that has some significance of your lifetime. And by the way, if you don't believe what I'm saying, I just want you, before you go to bed some night, say, well, that nutty rich martini. What was that he said? What's a previous life that has some significance in my lifetime? Let's see if I can dream about it. And let me know if you have a dream or something comes into your consciousness. So, we're going through black, I don't see anything. My eyes are closed, don't see a thing, don't see a thing. And I keep saying, I don't see anything. He says, just look down. Okay. And so in my mind's eye, I do this. Oh, it's interesting. I see my feet. They're bare. Bare feet. I'm in a creek. And he says, you know, what are you wearing? And then I see buckskin. <laughs> And now I pull back, you know, like a visual pullback, and I see this American Indian in full buckskin with really long black hair and feathers stuck in it. And I laugh, because you're fully conscious when they do these sessions. And I laugh, and I'm like, oh, well, God, I'm an American Indian. Oh, great. You know, that's funny. Like, you know, dances with wolves, I'm sure, right? And he says, who are you? What do you do? I said, well, my name is, it sounds like Tatanka. Now, I saw Dances with Wolves. You know, that's the buffalo. Right? Tatanka. That was the big word in that movie. And I thought, I must, I'm a screenwriter. I'm making this up. i got to be making this up. <laughs> then he says, uh, what do you do? I said, well, I'm a medicine man. And, um, and my name is not Tatanka, but it sounds like Tatanka. It's Watanka. Okay. I'm like, why am I making up a weird name? If I, if I don't like the name, I'm, anyway. He says, let's go, to your, let's go to your village. And I said, I don't really want to go there right now. Why? And then I saw why. Everyone was dead. And I saw a village of people massacred, blood everywhere, bodies everywhere, things smoldering. And then I walked over to my teepee. And I felt that physical thing of opening it and looking down and seeing a woman with long black hair, dead. Throat was cut, blood. And I said, they've killed my wife and taken my son. Now, how would I know there was a son there? And why would I make that part of it up? But I felt the full emotion of that sentence. And I started to sob, you know, racked the sobs. And I was, my conscious mind is going, if you're making this up, why are you doing this? Why aren't you just saying it? Why are you feeling it? And I just felt it go through me. And, uh, and then he, you know, I, I described it. I said, oh, it was this, this stupid argument that happened between one chief of a tribe and another chief. And he said, what tribe? I said, oh, it's the god dang Hurons. Hurons? And my conscious mind is saying, Hurons, they're in upstate New York. You're claiming to be Lakota Sioux, and they're Huron. That's just not possible, Rich. If you're going to make up this story, make it make sense. But I, you know, the, one of the maxims is don't edit, just say. So, um, six months later, I'm going to go back to it, but six months later I was at a funeral in Eau Claire, Wisconsin, one of my aunts passed, sitting down at a table, and I started talking to this cousin of mine. What are you doing? Well, I'm a historian for the Lakota Sioux. Really? That's unusual. Um, how'd you get that gig? And then we talk about his journey and blah, blah, blah. And they initiated him and all this other stuff. And, and I said, well, can I ask you? I mean, I had this weird experience. He said, wait, wait, wait. Just, just tell me this. What were you wearing? I said, well, buckskin. He said, uh, how many feathers did you have? And I said, two. He said, were they up <laughs> like that? Or were they down? I said, well, they were down. He said, well, that means you were a medicine man. Oh, I hadn't said that. I said, okay, well, why did I say my name was Watanka? He goes, because Wakantanka means the great spirit. That's what they call their medicine men, shortened version. I couldn't find it online. 
but he told me, Watanka is short for Wakantanka. I said that like a Sioux, didn't I? <laughs> and then I said, well, what's this about the Huron and the, and the Lakota? He said, you're sitting in the spot where they fought for 60 years, Eau Claire, Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. Now those were details I couldn't look up. So it couldn't be cryptomnesia as what science says hypnosis is. Something you read or saw or were aware of or heard. Not possible in this particular case. Okay. So now we went to the last day of that life and I said I was carrying a bottle of whiskey, <laughs> fire water, it was empty, and I was walking into the Mississippi and I saw the muddy banks and this kind of wood and I was wearing this floppy hat and, and I was killing myself. And the hypnotherapist said, oh, I'm so sorry, you know, why, why did you feel the need to do that? And I said, because they took everything from me. They took my culture, they took my people, they took my family, they took my belief. Why stay here? And as I said it, I thought, wow, wow, dramatic, you know, as a writer, like, wow, where does that come from? But I said it from the heart. And then he said, where would you like to go? And I said, I want to go home. And then I felt myself flying through deep space. And as I got somewhere in the outer regions of somewhere, out of a mist came 20 people that I recognized, friends of mine, and then this guy came out of the mist who was my spirit guide. Somebody, it was you, Woody. No, I'm kidding. No, but, <laughs> but somebody that I recognized who had been with me according to what I'm saying for all my lifetimes. And he then led me to what some people call a healing center and I felt myself sitting down and, and regenerating my energy because they say that only about a third of our energy comes here and two thirds stays behind. So I had that physical experience of reconnecting with Rich, okay? At the same time, the skeptical hat's on and he says, where do you wanna go? And I said, I wanna see my soul group. And I look around and I'm in a classroom and everyone's dressed in white. Oh, that's interesting. But Luana's not there, but I'm in a classroom and I recognize this teacher who I say I, say I know her. And he, the therapist says, so what, what's the class in? And I said, well, it's a class in um, energy transfer, and energy healing of fractals. Now, I don't, I've never used the word fractal in a sentence before. <laughs> I don't even know what it means. I do now, but at the time I was like, fractals, what? I said, everyone travels with the previous, the energy of their previous lifetimes in their, uh, their immediate vicinity. That they, they are the sh in the shape of geometric shapes, and they carry all the past life memories, the emotions mostly, so that when you need them in a time of crisis, you can access them, sometimes through your dreams. And then this classroom, is actually teaching people how to clean them up when you come back to the life between life realm because they, they get gunk on them. I don't know what I'm saying. And then he says, well, what, how do they function? And I said, well, they function like ball bearings. You know how ball bearings work. They help machines run. Well, these things work as ball bearings to help us get through our lifetime. Now, I'm just telling you, as I'm saying it, I'm thinking, who is this guy talking? He's not familiar to Bridge at all. But it's also like I'm conscious, I'm really kind of sitting back going, what? Anyway, so now he says, where do you want to go? And I say, I want to go see Luana. And now what's interesting is when I walk the experience, when I'm just trying to tell you what I experienced. And as I walked into this classroom, there was about 20 students facing that direction. And the teacher was up there and she was like, oh, Rich, you're here. And the students turned around and was like, oh, the teacher's friend, oh, this is exciting. You know? So I'm talking and she's talking. And, they're kind of like excited. And I've taught, so I know what that experience is like. But now the second place I go, it's a classroom I'm not wanted in. And I appear in the back of this classroom, and I see a teacher up there, gentleman, in his, I don't know, 60s, let's say, and uh, I know his name, and I say, oh, that's a very deep class. This is a healing class where they teach, they teach how to help healers on earth practice. How, like doctors, when they go in to do an operation, they call upon the healing light of the universe to help the client. And one of the students in the class turns around and goes, that is so not correct. <laughs> and I'm 
thinking to myself, oh, that's funny. You know, like they're aware of me and then they're mocking me. You know, like you're an idiot. You know, you don't know what you're talking about. So I say, in defense of myself, I say, well, it's a much more complex concept because they're teaching the healing arts, except when a doctor comes in, it might not be in his game plan to save this particular client, or the client themselves may have wanted to experience what it's like to go through that illness. So but you can't prevent them from doing that. Anyway, and uh, they seem satisfied with that. And then Luana's looking at me like, what the heck are you doing here? She's about 21 years old. She's got a, a blonde, bright blonde hair and a ponytail. But it's her. It's her you know. And I talk to her. Hey, what's going on? She's like, are you on a talk show? Like, why are you standing in my classroom and talking? You see, because I'm talking to the hypnotherapist. So I embrace her, and I and now I found her. I went. I did it. Okay, but now I got more stuff to do. So let's go to Rich's Council of Elders. So I get into this room, and I see eight individuals. This is the way people always see them. There's one who does the speaking, and the rest are around. But if you're if you have clarity in that moment, you can say, oh, that person represents courage. That person represents compassion. That's a music person. Each one representing something you've mastered in a lifetime. Okay? And I'm describing all these people, what they look like, and how their energy looks, because you can describe that as well. And now I have my list of questions. And don't forget, I have a trick question in there. Right? Remember? Yeah. When I made my questions, they're not going to leave me anywhere. I got a trick question. So now they go, Rich, what's, you know, what's your questions? And the first question is, what's the meaning of vanum populatum? It's a Latin phrase that no one knows except me. And I, I knew the hypnotherapist wouldn't know it. I also knew that nobody in the spirit world would know it either. Right? Unless they're smarter than me. <laughs> And not only are they smarter than me, but I realized how funny that particular concept was. Now, what does Vanum Populata mean? I was sitting in Santa Monica one day, waking up from a nap where all great things happen. And I heard someone speaking to me in Latin. Vanum Populata. And I had the presence of mind to write it down. What the? Vanum Populata. <laughs> that looks Latin. I didn't speak Latin. I never took Latin. So I went to the Latin dictionary called Google and looked up Bonham. I was startled. It's a word, Bonham. It means something. Wow, that's great. It means vanity. Okay, vanity. That's interesting. Okay, populatum. Wow, that means to annihilate completely, to utterly destroy, to wipe off the face of the earth. Who's telling me to wipe vanity off the face of the earth? I mean, I live in L.A. You know, where do you begin? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I've been, I've been trying to get rough. Well, Cheryl, thank you for coming. I wish I could stay. That's okay. Um, so I was really trying to get my mind around what the heck does that mean, but then I realized, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Annihilate vanity. Destroy the ego. That's the thing you learn in Zen Buddhism, right? You've all heard that? kill the ego, destroy the ego. But this is a different version of the ego meaning the self. You know, the, that, that concept means that the self is relatively always changing and always adjusting and always moving. This is something different. Annihilate or kill the things of the self that are false. False gods, you want to call it that. Vanity, fame, money, cars, things, stuff looks better than, judgment, all of it, annihilate it. <laughs> wow. So I, I really went my mind around, I was like, who's telling me this? And I had this kind of thought, like, it was like an older version of myself telling me. And then I thought, well, you know, maybe I was a Roman in a past life or something, but why would I talk to myself in a language I don't speak? That doesn't make any sense. Okay, that's as far as I could get with that brain fritz. But I knew what the meaning of Vanum Populatum was. So now here I'm in front of my council. And I say, what's the meaning of Vanum Populatum? And they erupt with laughter. Ah! <laughs> they think that's hysterical. And the lead guy says, why don't you ask Rich? 
He knows the answer to it. And when he says that, an image of me appears lying on the couch where I'm doing this session and filming myself. <laughs> Almost like a cartoon. Why don't you ask him? Why don't you ask Rich? He knows the answer to that. And in that answer, I had two amazing concepts suddenly appear in my head. One was he didn't say, why don't you ask yourself? You know the answer to that. He was talking about the temporary you, that guy. So he was addressing the older me, the one who devised the question, knowing that Rich likes to do puzzles and that he would go down and, and Google it. And then because he Googled it, he'd hear it and understand it and, and have a, a concept of what it is rather than just going in one ear and out the other. So I got both of those answers from that one question. Anyway, I won't bore you with all my questions, they're all in the book, but I'll get to the last one and it relates to us, it relates to Rebecca Hall, it relates to you, it relates to all of us, as much as I know you guys. And that is, why did I choose Rich? That was my question. Why did I choose Rich Martini? What was I thinking? So, the answer was, unusual, but worthy of repeating. Every thought action, word, or deed contains energy. And when you think of something, or think of a person, or write an email, or paint a painting, or write a song, or sing a song, or give a sermon, your energy goes into those words and out into the people who experience it. You can't see it. It's a subtle energy, but it affects them. It affects the planet. It affects everyone. So if your intent is good, of course, you're going to have that much of a broader and more dramatic effect. I chose to be a filmmaker because film can change a person's disposition instantly. Laughter, a guffaw, they eliminate all the stress and worries that they've had in their life. And then I said, tears work identically, except they require catharsis. <laughs> I've never used catharsis in a sentence before. But I understand it, which is, yeah, when you go through tears, you go through the process, and then eventually you come out the other side, you have the same effect of guffawing, of belly laugh. And I said, every artist and every person that puts their energy into their work or what they're doing or their intent, they may not see the effect of it, but it does change people on the planet. And then I said, I just wish, I just wish Rich was better at it. So I was referring to myself as a filmmaker because you've never heard of me. You know, I've been at this a long time. Making films, directing movies, blah, blah, blah. you're like, Rich Martini, who? You know, I've done a lot of work in that thing and I'm just not that good at it. Let's just put it that way. So I got a huge laugh from my counsel when I said that and I got a laugh from the hypnotherapist in the room. So it's the only time I've gotten a laugh from two planes at the same time. <laughs> and then I said, well, I think that's about to change. So. I then went down and I started writing this into a book um, after this session. I walked out of there, I felt like I'd taken the red pill, I started writing it into a book. And I had a real hard time, I had about 20 hours of a documentary, but it was like, I can't tell the whole story, so I put it all in the book. And then the book, once I finished that, I, it freed me up to do the documentary as a, as a side piece, as something that you know, you could look at them both. You can actually hear what people are saying when you read the transcripts of the, the actual text itself. So, a couple of more things. Just want to check my time, my timer. Make sure I'm doing okay. I'm doing okay. All right, so that was part two. <laughs> part three. Okay. So, are you sitting down? <laughs> so, um, it's always good to talk about real things that have really happened to you because that gives this stuff more, um, I mean, not that I'm not credible, <laughs> but let's just say, you know, when you talk about what's happening to somebody else, it, it's a value. So when my son, who has, you know, been here quite a bit, um, when my son was two, I was in Chicago visiting my folks, and he got on the phone, and he, his first sentence to me, up to that point, it was like, love you, good night, okay. His first sentence to me was, Dad, I was a monk in Nepal. <laughs> and he said it like he'd been waiting to tell me that for two years. <laughs> and I said, put 
your mother on the phone. Because it was like, what? What are you guys doing over there? What's, what are you, why did you say that? And she said, I don't know. I have no idea. I have no idea why he said that. Oh, okay. Were you guys looking at a movie or a thing? And, no. <coughs> Dad, I was a monk in Nepal. Okay. About a year later, I was here in Santa Monica up in Krispy Kreme. Wife and daughter had gone in there to get a donut. He's in the back seat in his little, you know, his baby seat, three. I'm looking at him in the rear view mirror. And I say, so RJ, did you meet daddy before? Did you know daddy from before? He said, yeah. I said, where'd you meet me? Tibet. Excuse me? You, you met me in Tibet? Yeah. Where in Tibet? On the path. No. I've been in Tibet. <laughs> I've been on a lot of paths in Tibet. But I'm thinking, is he saying a philosophical path? Like suddenly the three-year-old is talking like a professor. Like, what? And, and then I was thinking to myself, what is he saying? He met me on a path in Tibet. How could that? Wait a second. When I was on Mount Kailash in western Tibet with Robert Thurman making this film, this documentary, Journey into Tibet, he said, if you make a wish on this spot, it's the most sacred spot on the planet. And it will come true. I thought, okay, that's great. I'm going to wish for a million dollars. No, I want a three-picture deal. That's what I want. I want a three, no, I can use a million dollars. A million dollars, three-picture deal. And I really went back and forth. Three, you know, you're up at 16,000 feet, so, you know, your, your brain is not. Anyway, I said, well, whatever comes out of my mouth, that's my wish. And out of my mouth came, I want a son. And as I said it, it was, it was like, what? Who said that? I mean, we had a daughter. We weren't planning on any more kids. It literally came out of nowhere. And I thought, oh, it must be like I'm a male and it's a genetic thing and it just, it's there. We just aren't aware of it. That's what I thought, right? But now I'm back in the car with him. And I say, do, do, you, mean, do you mean I'm Mount Kailash? And he said, no. Well, not on Mount Kailash, a path in Tibet. Do you mean Kangra? He said, yeah, it was Kangra. Kangra is the name of the path that goes around Kailash in Tibet. But I said it, so it's not like he said it. By the way, one day he had some friends over and he was looking at some Tibetan art that I have. And uh, he said to his friend, I used to speak that language, but I don't speak it anymore. <laughs> so now when he was four, I was working on the movie Salt. All seen it, oh, yeah. Angelina Jolie. You probably didn't recognize me as the guy who walks her out of uh, North Korea, but uh, I'll, I'll forgive you. <laughs> no, I worked on it for two years as uh, Philip Noyce's assistant and, and ombudsman. But anyway, um, he was visiting. RJ and, and Sherry and Olivia were all visiting, and, and I had sublet apartment in the village while working on this movie. And RJ went to the guy's library and pulled two books out and walked one book over and threw it in the trash. Sherry said, what, what are you doing? <laughs> he said, that book is worthless. <laughs> this is the important one. And it was Robert Thurman's book, Circling the Sacred Mountain, with a picture of Mount Kailash on the cover. And he opened it up to the place where I made the wish, pointed to it and said, that's where I found Daddy. So Sherry called me on the phone. Did you talk? Did you show him? Did you talk about? I was like, what are you talking about? I had never said Kailash to him other than that time in the car. This is fully a year later. This is where I found Daddy. Okay. So a year after that, we're here in a Tibet shop up in Topanga Canyon. Sherry comes up to me and says, I, where'd RJ go? He's missing. I said, it's a small shop. He can't be far. You know, they're playing the Tibetan music and stuff. She finds him in the back room. He's doing full prostrations in front of a mirror. And full prostrations are hand over the head, to your mouth, to your heart, all the way down to the ground. When you touch your head to the ground, touch your forehead to the ground, you come back up, you do it again, over and over and over again. It's a famous thing that lamas do these 20,000 times. It's something you do without thinking about it. And he was obviously not thinking about it because she watched him for three minutes as he did full prostrations. Something I've never shown him, something he'd never seen. And then he sees his mom in the mirror and says, Mom, come here. Listen, you need to meditate more, and this is how you do it. 
And then he said, you hear the music, you hear the Tibetan bells? Every time a bell rings, peace comes into the world. Mm -hmm. Now, I didn't know that, but I did ask a Tibetan friend, point blank, what does it mean when you hear a Tibetan bell on music? He said, well, it means peace comes into the world. I, I didn't know, wasn't aware of that. So he was aware of it before I was. And then about a year ago, um, my mom was about to pass away. And I got the call from her caregiver and said, you know, you got to come home. And I thought about what my kids would see when they saw grandma once again. And, you know, she would be in a casket, a coffin, as we are. And what that, because I remember seeing my first relative in one, and it's startling, you know. So I sat them down and said, you know, the next time you guys see grandma, she's not going to be alive. And RJ, you know, he was a prop. Picked up a picked up a bottle of plastic bottle of water, it was half full. Cap was on, and he said, "It's okay, Dad. Spirit is like water. Watch." And then he started jumping up and down on it. I mean, both feet. Glee, gleefully, wee, jumping, smashing, smashing. Till it was like that, plastic bottle, cap still on. And he held it up to me and he said, you see, the water's okay. Easily the most profound explanation of our journey I've ever heard. The water is okay. Your spirit, your body gets old, it gets crumpled. It gets crushed. Your spirit is okay. It goes back home to heaven, goes to heaven, whatever you want to call it. It goes back. We reconnect with the people that we've loved and known and loved before. We decide to come back here or, according to some people, there's other places to go. But generally, this is the ballpark. We come back with our beloved ones. And we agreed and pretend like we don't know each other because that's how you make stories interesting. And then we reconnect and we help each other and we do these things. So I continue to film after the book was done and recently I had a studio executive uh, who worked on Independence Day call me up and say, okay, okay, let's do it. <laughs> do what? Your, your thing that you do, your life between life saying, let's go do it. Okay, well, you know, you should call Scott and you know, go through the process. Yeah, yeah, okay, will you drive me out there? Okay, all right. So we get in the car and we're driving out there and she's in her 40s and uh, a very skeptical person. But she turns to me and says, you know, Rich, I don't, I don't buy it. I'm not buying it. I love it when people say that. I'm not buying it. Like I'm selling it to you. I'm not buying it. Just don't buy it. What's that? This whole saying, this whole, you know, I'm past life. Nonsense. Okay. So where, where are we going out here? Well, I have, I have a tumor. I have a tumor in my ovary. And I need to find out if I can help myself in any way, subconsciously. So it's worth it to me. I mean, if I can talk to my subconscious and that can help heal me, then, then it's worth it to go out here and do this thing. Okay, <laughs> okay, great. So, I mean, I'm sorry to hear about, you know, this operation because it's always like, wow, that's, you know, what does that mean? But anyway, so we get out there and I set up my camera and that one and uh, Scott. Um, and there's, like I say, there's many of these guys that do this. And Scott sets up the thing, and he starts going back through this life, and now he gets to a previous life. That's questioned, you know, you have a previous... And she goes through a long, you know, I don't see anything, and I'm thinking to myself, oh, no, you know, we're not going to get anywhere. And then she says, oh, yes, it's Arizona, it's 1820, my name is blah, blah, and I'm in my 80s, and I've married a young girl, and uh, we've taken the buckboard out for a ride, and now she's convinced me to get out of the buckboard, and now she's driving away with the buckboard. <laughs> <laughs> and she's left me here to die. And then, like a whole string of profanity, 
I'm thinking to myself, wow, you know, she's really into this. And meanwhile, this is what I do while I'm listening to these things. I Google everything they're saying. You know, like, what? So I find the town, you know, in Arizona that this person claims to be from. And da -da 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 -da. A lot of details that I can look right up. And, and now we get to the last day of this cranky curmudgeon's life. And um, Scott says, so what are, you, what are you experiencing? What are you seeing? She says, well, I feel myself stepping out of, stepping out, stepping aside from him. And what's that emotion like? And she says, I'm dancing with glee. And he says, you know, it's unusual to hear, you know, the last day of your life, what's that about? She said, I always wanted to be a cranky old man and I finally did it. <laughs> so, now, so now she's, this young, <coughs> describes herself as this young spirit, and she goes back to her soul group. And the soul group, she's got six people in her soul group. She can't see a couple of the faces, because as you go through these, these processes, you know, you're not supposed to see certain things, because they're going to show up in your life. And you, like, again, you don't want to know the ending. Oh, you know, there's my mailman. <laughs> but she recognizes one person there. Um, but then she says, we're playing, they're playing this elaborate game of hide and seek. Now that's a frequent thing that people, I've never seen it, filmed it, but I've read it in Newton's books. People have games, playing kind of weird, energetic games, okay? So Scott says, well, describe it to us. What's the game? And she says, well, it's hide and seek, except you can be invisible. So you have to find where all of your other five soul group people are, invisibly, but on different realms. Not necessarily this plane, but other planes. I'm sitting there going, wow, imagine how difficult that game, 3D chess playing with energetic creatures you can't see. But there she is describing it, just as if it was the most common thing to talk about. And now we get to um, a point where he says, is there anyone, you've got a list of questions here, is there anywhere we can go so you can answer these questions? And she, and she describes what many people describe as, in different ways, but a, a hall of records, almost like a library. You've heard, you might have heard of the term Akashic records, it's a thing that they talk about in the East, but in my experience, everybody has a different visual of what that is. Some people see it as a library, she saw it as stacks, library stacks, like 40 feet high. She saw these very elaborate wooden tables that you'd go and tap and a screen would come up and you could examine previous lifetimes that you've had. And, and in Newton's books, people get into the, you know, the myriad of things that they could have done with that lifetime. But she's describing that. And then we get to her spirit guide who is also a little bit of a cranky person. And he's, his attitude is kind of, he feel, he's like, why are you bothering me? <laughs> you know, don't you have something else to do? You're gonna ask me, I got stuff to do up here. You're gonna ask me a bunch of questions? Okay, I'll answer your questions. So the first question was, what about this tumor that I've got? And he says, it's nothing, it's physical. Just go in, your doctors are good, get it taken care of, don't worry about it. Which, you know, if you're making up a whole spiritual thing, practice thing, you don't say that. You would say, oh, you must come back for many consultations so we can discuss this. But no, his attitude is like, it's fine, don't worry about it. So her follow-up question, which I had said to her, you know, maybe you should ask this, is there anything the hypnotherapist Scott can do or say that will help me in my spiritual journey so that I can stay healed? And the spirit guy says, why, is he a surgeon? <laughs> I told you, just get it taken care of. It's not a big deal. What else? <laughs> okay, so she had three questions that she had written down. And the reason I, I repeat them is because she was a skeptic. But if I get somewhere, why not? Here are the three questions. What is the meaning of the shift? Those of us familiar with New Age nomenclature, the shift is what people were talking about or have been talking about, some kind of a shift in consciousness that seems to be happening on the planet. You'll hear it from, from a lot of different writers and different people, but you know, people also were tying it to cosmological events, like there's gonna be a tectonic shift and the Earth will you know, spin out of whatever. People were afraid of that term, and I've heard it many times. 
but what's the meaning of the shift? And the second question is, does the universe, this is for you, I'm sure, does the universe function as a machine? From your science background, does it function as a machine? And what or who is God? <laughs> I thought, wow, these are pretty good questions, you know, especially for a skeptic. And I get to hear the answers. All right, so, and I'm going to share them with you. So the first answer was the shift. The spirit guide says, you humans, I mean, it really puts it that way, you humans always feel the need to name things so that you can get a better handle on them. <laughs> up here, he doesn't say up here, but he says here, he doesn't say up, he just says here we call that the quickening. And I've heard that other, in other sessions. People call it saying, oh, that's not the shift, it's the quickening. But he says it. Here we call it the quickening, meaning, meaning from what I understand, you know, your vibrational level is changing for whatever reason. And so we are starting to become more aware of these concepts and things and become more accepting of them, let's just say. Okay. But what he says is just that. Here we call it the quickening. In terms of the cosmos, it's not that big of a deal. And I love people who use the cosmos or cosmological events as their touchstone, you know. And, you know, when Saturn spun out of control, you know, that was a big deal. This, no big deal. <laughs> so he says, in terms of the cosmos, not a big deal. However, if you want to understand a shift in consciousness, imagine yourself a crab walking on the ocean floor, and you open your eyes and realize you're in an ocean. That's a shift in consciousness. Now, I've heard that before. I just happened to see it, a science program the other day where somebody was w watching a fish, and he said, now imagine if you could talk to the fish, and you'd say, so what's water like for you? And he would say, what are you talking about? <laughs> what? Water? What do you mean? Because we're not aware of oxygen, are we? O2. You know, we're not aware of it, yet here we are sharing it constantly in an unseen realm, breathing, unbreathing, breathing, exhaling, not breathing. Okay. Okay. So what or who is God? Is anybody on the edge of their seat? No. I was. What or who is God? And the spirit guide said, God is beyond the capacity of the human brain to comprehend. It's just not physically possible. However, you can experience God by opening your heart to everyone and to all things. Now, let's just take that apart for a second. He just said three sentences very specifically. God is beyond the capacity of the human brain to comprehend. Okay. Okay, that's a little bit way of saying, you know, you're not smart enough to get it. But it's also saying that the physical capacity of the human brain trying to comprehend all things and all energy systems simultaneously is beyond us mentally. But it's not beyond us through our hearts. Open your heart to everyone and to all things, not just to everyone, but to all things. All right, so what does that mean? Open your heart. Open your heart. What does that mean? Partially, it means drop your defenses. When you're shielding yourself, your heart's not open, is it? When you open your heart to everyone, then judgment is off the table. Bad person, terrorist, Evil person, evil acts or something else, evil person, take judgment off the table. Because if you're going to open your heart to everyone, then you have to just consider that for a second. What does that feel like to be open to everyone simultaneously and to all things? Because this is Adam's agreeing to engage in this space as wood. We're atoms engaged in a space called physical. 
but we're all connected. We're all energy. We're all part of the same paradigm. And then beyond that, I realized this sentence, do unto others as you would do unto yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself because your neighbor is yourself. It's a step beyond that platitude becomes something much more resonant. God is love. We've heard that our whole life, but I say flip it around. Love, what we understand is the connection between all of us, as best as we can define it. You know, every language has a different definition of what love is. It's not the same. It's not the same for me. It's not the same for you. Everybody, just like looking at the sunset, we all experience it. We go, oh, that's beautiful. But each one of us sees it from a different paradigm. So try to take that into the this essence of what love is. So that thing of love and connectedness to all of us, that is the experience of God. And hence why this talk is called Love. Okay, thank you. <laughs> All right, now I've, I've got some... Uh, I've